Man, it's so good to see so many smiling faces on a Sunday morning. You know, it's even better, but it's even better when you're up here and you, you see a bunch of familiar people, and then you see a bunch of unfamiliar people, right? That's the point. I see your wave. Somebody's waving at me who looks unfamiliar, right? <laughs> well, good morning. Hey, we're excited. Whether you've been here for a long time or whether today is your first Sunday, we are excited that you chose Life Church X this morning to come and worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There's, I, in my hand, I have one of our red cards. You can find one in the seat back in front of you. Uh, I'd ask you, especially if you're new here or even if you haven't filled one of these out before, to fill out this card and with any of your personal information that you feel comfortable with. This is just our way of getting to know you and starting to develop a relationship with you. Uh, speaking of new visitors, next Sunday, which is August 14th, we have a new visitors meet and greet. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Hey, it's still early on a Sunday morning. I get it, but we'll, we'll, we'll get the hang of this. We'll get the hang of this. So, hey, I'm not the most outgoing person in the world, so I'm going to need some help. I'm going to need some help. But next Sunday, August 14th, after second service, so about 1 o'clock, we're going to have a new visitors meet and greet right here. So if you've been with us in the last three, four months or maybe just last three, four days. We'd love to get you get to know you. Come meet, uh, if you haven't mes- met Pastor Matt and Pastor Katie yet, the opportunity to meet them, some of our other pastors and some of our other key leaders. So uh, we look forward to meeting you next Sunday after second service. Also coming up on August 21st is water baptism. So if you have never been water baptized and you'd like to, or you have a family member or a friend or somebody that has always wanted to get water baptized, August 21st is the day for you. You can talk to any of us here at the church. You can call the church office, and we'll get you all signed up for that. Also, Friday night, August 26th, is what we're having. In, it's called Encounter Night. Some of you have probably attended one of our Encounter Nights in the past, but we're bringing them back. Uh, we're doing one in Jerseyville the Friday night before that at our Jerseyville campus. In August 26th, we're going to do one uh, right here in our Waterloo, Columbia campus. So you say, what is an Encounter Night? And Encounter Night is simply, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to go deeper with Christ, to encounter, let's say, the, the fullness of Christ and the fullness of what he has for us. So uh, we're going to be talking about that in the next upcoming week, so you're not going to want to miss that Friday night, August 26th. Amen? Amen. Well, if Life Church X is your church home, now is your opportunity to give. You can give in numerous ways. You can write out a check to Life Church X, and you can drop it in the containers uh, in the back after service along. You can put the red cards in there as well. You can check out our website. You can text to give, text the amount to 84321, or you can mail uh, check in to 9538 Caring Way. Let's pray over the offering. Father, we just thank you. First and foremost, as Pastor Guy alluded to, the, the unconditional, extreme, agape love that you have for us. Everything that we do starts and finishes with that love, that amazing love that you have for each and every one of us. And Lord, we just pray that as we react to your love in one simple way of giving our offering back to you, Father Lord, that it would bless your holy name. Lord, I just pray as these people give into your kingdom to do what you want with it, Lord, that they would be extremely blessed. And everything that we do and say this morning would honor and glorify your most holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. Well, I'm excited just from announcements. <laughs> like, I want to see, I am looking forward to meeting all those new people. If you don't know me, I'm Pastor Katie. Um, and I just hope that if you are new in the last three months or so, that you would come to that because we want an opportunity to get to know you. Um, We love to know the people that come to our church, to know your story, to know your questions, and to have those answered. And so if you can make it, please come. Um, And then I'm excited about baptisms. I'm excited about the encounter night. Who's excited about those encounter nights? Okay, for all of the rest of you, that means you haven't been to one. You need to be here, okay? Okay. Um, So last week, I was at youth camp. Youth camp. Teenagers. I mean, come on, guys. Um, Anyway, it was absolutely phenomenal. Um, So just a couple quick quick updates. First of all, 
I was so blessed. There were four people in our church that anonymously decided to step up and to send a kid to youth that didn't have the funds to be able to go. And that was just so amazing. We didn't ask for that. We didn't tell anybody that anybody needed it. It was just people that said, hey, if there's some kid that can't go, I want to be the one that helps stand in the gap for them so that they can encounter God. So thank you so much for those of you who did that. Uh, we had about 30 kids from both campuses go, and I think we have a picture, if you could put that up there. Possibly. We don't have a picture. Um, sorry. But we did have about 30 kids go and a whole bunch of leaders that loved on those kids. Um, and it was just such a fantastic and amazing time to see those kids step out to see them encounter God, um, to see them worship in new ways. I mean, I was blown away by the boldness of these kids. And so I just want to say, if you're a parent that had a kid go, there were kids that made deep commitments to God. Encourage them. Encourage them. Ask them about it. Ask them about that experience and stand beside them, helping to hold their arms up to keep those commitments that they made to God, okay? All right. Well, we are in um, a series called The Supernatural Works of the Church. Last week, Pastor Mike, Matt talked on um, my husband on evangelism, um, and it was a really great message. If you weren't here for that, I encourage you to go out and watch that on our website. But the anchor scripture that he was talking about was Mark 16, verses 15 through 18. And the Word of God is powerful, so I encourage you, go and read that scripture before the series. Go and read that and let God speak to you and start to stir things in your heart so that when you come and you hear the message, there's things that God will confirm to you through that if you do that. But one of the things he said last week is that saved people lead lost people to freedom. That was powerful. Saved people, not sometimes, but they should always be leading lost people to freedom. And so I've been sitting here thinking, who are the lost that I'm leading to freedom? I'm a saved person. Who am I talking to? Who is my life an example for? Because I should always be leading people to freedom. All things supernatural, they need to operate through several things. One is love. We read that in 1 Corinthians. I think Pastor Guy was talking about that. And it said that if you don't have love, that a lot of these things that we do, it doesn't really penetrate and resonate in the hearts of people. But another thing that we need is wisdom. We need wisdom. Evangelism without wisdom can have the reverse effects. Let me give you an example. I was driving down the road and there was a church and their billboard said, get saved or die. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, wow, well, that's the truth. But it doesn't pull me closer to Jesus. That doesn't make me want to run to Jesus. And so we need wisdom in how we evangelize. We need wisdom in how we reach out to those lost people. So today I want to talk to you about wisdom. The definition of wisdom is the quality of having knowledge and good judgment, the quality of being wise. But if we read in Proverbs verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 5, it says, Get wisdom, develop good judgment, don't forget my words or turn away from them. Don't turn your back on wisdom, for she will protect you. Love her and she will guard you. Getting wisdom is the wisest thing that you can do. And whatever else you do, develop good judgment. If you prize wisdom, she will make you great. Embrace her, and she will honor you. She will place a lovely wreath on your head, and she will present you with a beautiful crown. We are charged with getting wisdom, loving it, and pursuing it. So that means we aren't born with it. It's not just going to fall on us. Just because we get older doesn't mean we automatically have it, although some people say that. We have to pursue wisdom. It's a choice to go after it or to turn our back on it. If we have to go after it, then we can assume that we won't just land in it by mistake. But when we do, it protects us and it guards us. Wisdom isn't evasive either, and it isn't hard to find. In Proverbs 1, verse 20, it says, Out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the public square. And so sometimes people think, man, it's hard to find wisdom, but the Bible tells us, no. Wisdom is saying, here I am. Here I am. Come find me. Come get me. I want to give it to you, but you have to come after it, and you have to pursue it. There are different types of wisdom. There's the wisdom of this world, 
There's godly wisdom, and there are what the Bible calls words of wisdom. And so as we talk today, I want you to think about this question. What kind of wisdom do you most often operate from? What kind of wisdom do you most often operate from? Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Father God, we come before you as a unified body. Lord God, and we're asking for you to speak to us. Lord Jesus, we need you. We don't need my words. We need your words. And so, God, I pray today that you would reveal things that are hidden. Lord God, that you would open our eyes to see things that we have not yet seen, that our ears would be open to hear your voice, Lord God, and that you would reveal our hearts to us, Father, so that we can grow in wisdom. We're a people that needs your wisdom, Lord God. And so we invite you to speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first type of wisdom that I want to talk about is earthly wisdom. How many of you guys have heard of earthly wisdom or wisdom of this world? A few of you. Good. So then you are in the right place today. Um, The wisdom of this world is the logic and thought processes of this world. It's the world's way of doing things. It's based on things like the culture of today. The Bible tells us that earthly wisdom is centered around self, what I understand, what I see, what I feel, and what I want. We were driving down the road to go to camp, and one of the girls decided that they were going to have some fun, and they were going to make a face at cars driving by. And so the face wasn't anything mean. It was just like a bug-eyed face. Katie, do you want to stand up and show us? No. Okay. She's, it's okay. It's okay. But she decided to make a face at just this car driving by, a silly face. Well, this lady who saw that face had an opportunity to be like, oh, silly kid. But that wasn't her choice. So I had to pray a lot for our girls that just saw a whole bunch that they should not have had had to see and heard a few things that they should not have heard. And that was worldly wisdom. That was worldly wisdom. Unfortunately, she took something that was silly and sweet And she turned it into something because for whatever reason, she was offended by that. James 3, verses 13 through 18, said that if you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with a humility that comes from wisdom. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For, whatever, for wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. But the wisdom that is from above is first of all pure, it's also peace-loving, it's gentle at all times and willing to yield to others. It's full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of righteousness. We see the contrast of earthly wisdom versus godly wisdom. And this is such a great scripture because when I'm trying to figure out, oh, where'd that come from? An easy question to ask myself, was that selfish or was it not? Because that can decipher for us what is earthly wisdom and what is godly wisdom. Earthly wisdom fluctuates. It adjusts with time. It's conditional upon culture. 1 John 2.17 says, The world and its desires pass away. Earthly wisdom passes away, but whoever does the will of God will live forever. Can you think of some examples on your own of things that it was once truth, and then it changed. And then some new truth came, and then if you live long enough, then it changes. That's earthly wisdom. Earthly wisdom also conflicts with godly wisdom. 1 Corinthians 3.19 says, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God, for it is written, "He He is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. So when God looks at this earthly wisdom, it's like, that's such foolishness. You think you're wise, but you're not wise. You think you know, but if you just hang around a little bit, I'm going to reveal something to you to show you that you actually don't know. It conflicts with godly wisdom. A story that reminds me of this is Lot and Abraham. 
They were living together, and they were both growing, and they were being blessed, and God was blessing their livestock and blessing their property and, you know, their, their people and everything, and it became to where they could no longer live together. Like, the land that they were living on no longer could hold both of them. And so Abraham came to Lot because there was fighting amongst their people, and he was like, okay, Lot, we got to separate because we don't want this fighting Uh, we can no longer live together. It's become apparent. And so why don't you look and choose where you want to live? And so Lot said, okay. And he looked around and he saw what was beautiful to his eyes, is what the Bible said. He looked and he said, ooh, that land there, it looks good to my eyes. It doesn't give any reference that he prayed to God, that he asked for God's wisdom, that he spent any time considering truth. He just says, ooh, that looks good. Have you ever done that? Have you ever been like, ooh, that looks good? And you go after it. Well, the story goes on to tell us that what he wound up doing is living by Sodom. And Sodom was evil. God wound up raining fire on Sodom because of the evilness there. And his wife wound up getting caught up in that. And so when God tried to rescue Lot out of that later, his wife wound up turning into a pillar of salt. And that's what happened because he looked through his own eyes and he says, man, that looks good. I think that that would be what I want selfishness. And instead, he wound up losing everything because he left with only himself and his daughters. He lost everything. When we're approaching any situation, ask ourselves, is this honoring to me? Is it pleasing me? Or is it honoring God? I hear so many people say that they're making unwise decisions, or when they're making unwise decisions, that they're doing it because they're happy. I've said that. I won't ask you to raise your hands, but I'm sure all of you have said that too. I'm going to make this decision because it makes me happy. Well, God doesn't want us to pursue happiness. God didn't die for us to be happy. He died for us to be free. He died for us to be saved. And sometimes walking into freedom hurts a little. Sometimes it's a painful road to walk into freedom. Sometimes walking into the promised land takes us through lots of people that we have to fight, lots of armies that we have to defeat before we get there. Because if we just went after being happy, then we would sit in the comfort somewhere else and never grow and never let go. We're all called to submit our will to God's will. But we have to value the things of God to do that. We're to turn away from earthly things. And like James says in the scripture we read earlier, to pursue what is lovely, gentle, willing to yield. That's a big thing for me. Am I willing to yield? Because the wisdom that's from above is willing to yield. And we live in a culture that does not want to yield. And so we're going against the grain. The second type of wisdom that I'm going to talk about today is godly wisdom. Godly wisdom can simply be put as God's viewpoint. Where do we get God's viewpoint? From his word. What do we not need God's viewpoint on? Absolutely nothing. We always need God's viewpoint. The Bible is written so that we can learn who God is. We can learn how he thinks what his ways are so that we can know more and more how to walk wisely. And when we read that, if we respond, then we become wise people. It's really simple. Read the Bible, learn God's viewpoint, respond to it. Simple to understand, hard to walk out, but simple to understand. When we were down at camp, There was an opportunity given every night for the kids to respond in worship, to respond. And I wish that you could see the pictures because the way these kids responded in worship, there was about 100 kids there and they were almost all up at the altar, almost all with hands raised, many on their knees before God responding to him. And when they did that, he spoke. There were so many stories of how God spoke to these kids and they walked in freedom and as they did that they became wiser they became wiser because they responded study the wisdom of God study his scripture his truth and his viewpoint God's wisdom is selfless 
Godly wisdom doesn't change throughout time. It doesn't change throughout culture, through leadership changes, through scientific discoveries. Godly wisdom stays the same. In Isaiah 40, it says the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God will stand forever. I've heard a lot of people say that the Bible is outdated. And it blows me away. It blows me away because what they're saying is I would rather stand and build my life on some new thing, some new fad, some untested, unproven, false truth, rather than something that's been around for thousands of years that's never failed, that will never fail, that's been proven and tested true. It's such a weird viewpoint to me. The Bible is old and therefore proven and therefore worthy of me building my life on. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. This word fear here means awe, and it means reverence. Awe is a feeling of reverential respect mixed with fear or wonder. How often are you in wonder of God? How often do you sit and be like, wow, God, like wow, of some aspect of who he is? It's reverence, which is a deep respect for someone on something. Do you reverence God? Because that's the beginning of wisdom. If you're not there yet, dot, 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 (laughs) because that's the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 10.27 says, The fear of the Lord prolongs days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. How many want prolonged days? Just about four people. Okay. Um, New message for next week. Uh, The fear of the Lord prolongs days. Psalm 111.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and a good understanding have all of those who do his commandments, His praise endures forever. Do you do his commandments? Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. When someone brings instruction or correction to you, a godly person brings instruction or correction to you, how do you respond? How do you respond? I have responded like a fool sometimes, but I pray that I don't. I pray that my heart stays humble so that I can receive godly instruction because oftentimes that's what God does is he brings it through some flawed person to tell me that I messed up and I have a choice to say, but you, or thank you, God. Thank you for revealing something in me. We need to determine where we believe the source of wisdom come from. Is the source of wisdom me? Or is the source of wisdom God? It's one or the other. It's one or the other. So if I get to determine if the media is true, if I get to determine if science is true, if I get to determine if the new fad is true, or the new worldly way of thinking is true, what I'm saying is I am the source of wisdom. Ouch. But if I'm going to say that even though all that sounds good, but the word of God says, and then I align my life with the word of God, then I'm saying God's wisdom, or God is the source of wisdom, and even though something doesn't make sense to me, even though something maybe looks good or seems good, like the land that Lot saw, I'm going to say that I'm going to go with God's wisdom because he must know something I can't see yet. And I know I don't see everything. I know in reality I see such a small part. So it's do I believe that God sees everything, that he knows everything? Because if God is truth and he is the source of all wisdom, then when media comes out with something new that conflicts with God, we don't follow it. I submit my decisions and my actions to his truth even when I can't piece it together or when it doesn't make sense to me because I am not the source of wisdom. We had this um, thing at camp, it was called the talk back or whatever, and so they broke guys and girls up, 
and um, all the girls would talk, all the guys would talk, and the leaders would lead them. And so in one girl's talk back, the question was asked because they were asking them to tell questions, like, what do you want to talk about? Well, it was about anxiety. And so they asked the students to raise their hand for how many people deal with anxiety, like kind of on a regular basis. You'd have been blown away by the amount of girls that raised their hand. In a room of like 50 girls, there was probably 60 or 70 percent of those girls that raised their hands to say they dealt with anxiety on a regular basis. The world's answer is medicine. Right. And I'm not saying medicine doesn't help. Right. But what the real answer is, is you have the authority right. through the blood of Jesus to take your thoughts captive and to say, I'm not going to accept that thought. You have the authority. Amen. But if we don't teach them that, right. then their answer will be what the world gives them. Right. Then their answer will be, you have to live with this your whole life. That you can medicate it and you can you know, suppress it, but it's going to rise up and it's going to attack you. They will live in fear of the fear of anxiety their whole life. But when there's power in the name of Jesus. When you believe in the name of Jesus, there really is power to break that chain. That's right. Do you believe that? Amen. We're a society that's supposedly more self-aware than we've ever been before. Isn't that what we hear? But we are more broken, more hurt, in more pain, dealing with more things than we ever have before. Because we don't look to Jesus as a culture and the power that comes from that name. When you read something in the Bible, the wisdom of God, you do it even if it doesn't make sense to the earthly way of thinking. You have to submit to the truth in your mind that we do not have the answers, but God does. We're called to pursue wisdom. We find it in the heart of God. Proverbs 123 says, Repent at my rebuke, then I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make known to you my teaching. Do you want God to pour out his thoughts to you? I mean, I want God to pour out my thoughts to me, his thoughts to me. But it says, Repent at my rebuke. That came first. Then I will pour out my thoughts to you. The New Living um, Version of that same scripture says, I will share my heart with you and make you wise. I want God to share his heart with me. I want to know his heart. And he wants to share it with me. But I have to repent at his rebuke. The next type of wisdom I want to talk to you about today is a word of wisdom. A word of wisdom can be defined as a supernatural provision of divine wisdom or a right application of wisdom. It's the ability to instantly know how to speak in a certain situation that is beyond the ability of man and is primarily spoken. Okay? Here's some scripture. It's 1 Corinthians 2, starting in verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. So what they're saying is it's something we couldn't have known, but we're speaking it. It was a mystery. It says, The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. But it's written, I had not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except for the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except for the Spirit of God. And I'll stop there. Words or wisdom are given by the Holy Spirit. They come from Him alone. The natural self will often think that it's foolishness. It's your spirit that He speaks to. So a word of wisdom, when He comes and He tells you this is the way to handle a situation, you're kind of like, um, <clears throat> what? What? Like that? That's the way? Let me give you an example. Solomon. There was two women that came to him. They both had had a baby. 
It seems like the same night that they both gave birth that one lady rolled over on her baby and killed her baby. So in the middle of the night, she got up and she switched babies. And then she went back to bed. And so when they woke up in the morning, the lady that was holding the dead baby was like, this doesn't look like my baby. And so they went to Solomon to say, what do we do? Like, we're fighting over this one live baby. Now, I don't know what you would do because you don't know. And I'm sitting there like, how would you know whose baby's who? No one's really seen these babies. They're only like a day old or something. But this is what Solomon did. He said, okay, bring the baby here. Executioner, come here. Cut the baby in half. Give half to each woman. And then it'll be done. Now, does that sound like foolishness to your flesh? I'm, I'm like, cut the baby in half? But what he knew that God revealed to him is the mother would want to save that baby. And the mother would be like, never mind, never mind, just give it to her. How could he have known that if God didn't reveal that to him? God had to reveal that to him. That's what a word of wisdom does. Superna- it's, word of wisdom is a supernatural utterance at a given moment through the Spirit, supernaturally disclosing the mind, purpose, and will of God as applied to a specific situation. When you know what to do, but you really couldn't have figured it out on your own. A word of wisdom is a gift to the Spirit. So you have to be filled with the Spirit because the Spirit of God has to be talking to you. In 1 Corinthians 12, 7, it says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing, and we go on. So one of the gifts of the Spirit is a word of wisdom. And it'll come right on time, and it'll be precise, and it'll require faith. Let me give you another story of a good example of the word of wisdom. Paul and Ananias. Do you guys know that story? Saul, before his name was changed to Paul, he went around persecuting Christians. He was zealous for it. He was the one that sto- or oversaw the stoning of Stephen, which was one of the disciples of God that did mighty things. And he oversaw that, and he was on a mission. He went after getting permission to take every Christian that he could find and put them in jail or stone them or whatever it was. And here he's on this mission to do it, and God shows up, supernaturally blinds him, speaks to him, and sends him off to a home to go and wait for further instructions. So here this guy, Ananias. He wasn't a part of any of this, but he's heard of Saul. Because if you're a Christian, you've heard of Saul. And God comes and says, hey, I want you to go find Saul and pray for him. What? You you, you want me to go seek out the guy that's vowed to kill me if he finds me? Like, seriously? And he says, yes, I have spoken to him, and I want you to pray for him to receive his sight. I would have to have a word of wisdom from God to go and do something like that. But that's what God does. It's knowing how to handle something or navigate a situation that you wouldn't otherwise be able to know. It can't be naturally discerned. In the Next Gen Ministry, Pastor Brittany has been stepping in to really take over a lot of those responsibilities, and we've been talking a lot about student-led ministry. We're a church that raises up game changers. And we want to raise up people that make a difference in their world, and we want to start them out young as young as possible. And so we've been talking a lot about student-led ministry. And she came to me one day and she was like, I really feel like what we need to do is teach them how to share their testimony. Now, we're wanting to raise up leaders. And so, like, leadership training or, like, discipleship, like, testimonies. I mean, I get it, but, like, that's the number one way we're wanting to raise up leaders. But we did. And so she started working with three students and started teaching them how to share their testimonies, and they did it in youth. And so we go down to camp, and one of those students felt like God spoke to him and said, you need to share your testimony. And so he did, and so Joshua got up and he shared his testimony, which opened the door to a lot of other kids sharing the testimony that day, or, well, throughout the week, really. And what we find out is that later the pastor that was speaking, that lives in Texas, that's a missionary from somewhere else, wrote 
On Thursday, kids will share their testimony. He had no idea what we were doing here. He's not affiliated or related with our church at all. But God spoke to one of our student leaders and said, I want you to share your testimony so that hearts are stirred, so that on Thursday, five other kids will share their testimony and lives can be changed through you guys. And of the eight kids that wound up sharing their testimonies throughout that week, five of them were from our church. Five of them were from our church. We are raising up game changers in this church. God is raising up game changers in this church. But it started with a word of wisdom that Pastor Brittany said, even though it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, that's where we're going to place our focus. That's where we're going to put our efforts in, is in this thing that God said, even though it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Words of wisdom are given by the Holy Spirit as he sees fit. There have been times where the Holy Spirit has led me to, like, look in a certain place and reveal something my kids were doing. Has that ever happened to you? Okay, well, if it has not, you need that. Sometimes, youth, he's spoken to me about other kids. Um, But that's what the Holy Spirit does. He's going to keep things that we, or he's going to reveal things that we want to keep hidden. And as parents, we need that. Because if I was a parent trying to do this on my own, they would eat me up. (laughs) But when the Holy Spirit leads me, when he leads me, then I can be the parent that he's called called me to be. But another thing that he's doing in that moment, because when I come to my kid and I said, I know that this is happening, and they're like, how'd you know? And I'm like, the Holy Spirit revealed it to me, and I know. Do you know what they know in that moment? That there's nothing that they can do that will stay secret. That there is a God in heaven that sees them. There is a God in heaven that does not want them to be in bondage or to walk in sin. That he is continuing to draw them to himself. And that they will reveal to their mama what they've been doing so that they don't walk in chains. So that they don't live a life that's less than what he's called for them to live. As a parent, we all need the gifts of the Spirit. How do I walk in the gifts that God has given me? We seek Him. We pray. We study Scripture. We step out in faith. We grow in trust that He's going to catch us. We grow in Scripture. We learn them. We sow them into our hearts so that when a situation needs it, it's not something I have to run look for. It's something that's in me that the Holy Spirit can bring out of me. It's never relying on my own abilities. It's relying fully in Him. It's walking by the Spirit and not by flesh. A lot of times, God doesn't use us. And who say that they want God to use them? few more hands, a few more hands. Um, A lot of times God doesn't use us because we aren't active in sharing our faith and positioning ourselves to be used. If we're hiding in a corner, doing our own thing on our phones, going through our routine, saying, God, I'll get to you in a minute, we're not positioning ourselves to be used by God. There was a pastor years ago that said something and it resonated with me and I think of it often and she said everyone wants to see a miracle who wants to see a miracle like I pray God let me see a miracle I want to see you do all those things in the Bible like blind eyes open and all that stuff who wants to be in a position to need a miracle right exactly no one wants to be blind no one wants to be sick no one wants to be in the position of needing a miracle But we have to position ourselves to see God move. And so if we want to see God do things through us, we have to align our life with God. We have to say no to the things that are pulling at our attention, pulling for our time. The lesser things, we have to say no because I'm going to position myself to be used by God. I'm going to grow in wisdom. I'm going to seek him so that God can use me because I want to see the supernatural happen. I want to see blind eyes open. I want to see chains broken. But if he's going to use me to do it, then I have to position myself too. Otherwise, I either don't see it or I'm the one off on the sidelines going, good job, good job, people who are doing it. 
Who wants that? I want to be right up in the middle of God's will. I want to be right in the middle of what he's doing. I want everything that he has for me, and I want to do everything that he's called me to do. But ten times I have to go and seek wisdom for, to be used one time in someone's life. It's about that. Like, I have to be pouring way more into myself for God to use something out because he's got to grow me, and oftentimes it takes a whole lot longer for him to grow me than for me to share one thing with some person. Does that make sense? We need to position ourselves to be used. We need to seek wisdom. But in the midst of everything, if we don't find God, then what do we have? Because at the end of the day, he's the prize. I want to see the miracles, but I want to see him so much more. I want to see chains broken. I really do. But more than seeing your chain broken, I want to know God. I want to be close to him because he is the prize. If I don't find him, then how can I introduce him to the world? How can I raise people up in the knowledge of him if I haven't poured it in to myself? How can I know the authority to break those chains if I haven't experienced it in my own life, in my quiet time with him? Supernatural works are generally done through people who know Jesus, who walk by his spirit, who trust in his leading. Pursuing wisdom is pursuing God. The Bible says that when we pursue wisdom, we find God. So I want to ask you guys to close your eyes for just a moment. Bow your heads. At the beginning, I asked you to think about this question. Do you walk in the wisdom of the world or the wisdom that comes from God? And I realize that we can all say, well, both. But where do you walk in most often? Is it more godly wisdom? Are our lives aligned with God? Are we seeking him? Church, are we reading our Bible? I have lots of conversations with a lot of people, and the answer to that is not enough. Jesus is waiting. He's waiting to share his heart with you. He's waiting to pour his spirit into you. He's waiting for you to know him. Will you say yes? Will you say yes? And so I want to take a moment and I want you to have that conversation with the Holy Spirit in your heart. Because he's asking you, will you say yes to more? Wherever you are, you can say, I read my Bible every day. He still has more. You can say, I know God pretty well. He still has more. You can say, I would say I'm a pretty wise person. I would say, talk to God. <laughs> he has more for you. He has more for you. Will you say yes? Dear Father God, I just lift up each and every person in this room. Lord God, you know the conversation that they've had with you. You know the answer that they have given you, Lord. And I've been praying for this message for a long time that hearts would say yes to you. God, I pray that you meet them in that yes. I pray for deep revelation to pour into the hearts of every yes. I pray for you to help them work out schedules that, that are currently unhealthy because they don't have time to fit you. Help them to see how to work that out so that they can spend more time with you. Lord God, I pray that you meet every yes in a powerful way. We pray for miracles, Lord God. We pray for the supernatural to flow through this church. We pray for that army that is rising up, Lord God. But more than anything, I pray that this would be a people that knows you, that just knows you, that their highest pursuit is to know you, Lord God, that there's nothing that we value more than that. In Jesus' name, amen.